Let's worship this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All oh, my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn. Till I met you. Oh, 
to me that would talk to me and push me and tell me, man, God has a calling on your life and he loves you. Before you were even formed, he has a plan for you and I didn't hear it. I, I, I wouldn't hear it. I didn't want to hear it. I, I, I thought that I had all the answers myself. And when I hear this song, it's just, I'm, I'm, God is out there and he is inviting you. He, is, he has his arms stretched out to you and he says, son, daughter, just stretch your hand out and meet me, meet me halfway, and I will take you places that you have never dreamed of. And God is inviting you this morning. He says, even, even what I have blessed you with, that is just the tip of the iceberg. If only, if only you would let me take over your heart. Father, we love you and we praise you. Lord, we are so grateful for that invitation that never runs dry from you, Lord God. We are so thankful for the love that conquers all, Lord. We are just so asking you to be in this place. Anoint the words that are coming out of pastor's mouth this morning. Let them pierce our hearts this morning and do something unique for each and every one of us in here or at home. Wherever we are today, Lord God, we just want to hear you and to feel you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen. And God is good. Good morning. Morning, TBC here with us at the bridge and the family that's watching online and also anyone that is visiting here or visiting us for the first time online, we are glad that you joined us. Amen. Thank you, Justin, for that encouragement. God is a good God. He's good all the time. We're not good all the time, but, but he is good all the time. Amen? He's, he's a precious God. Let's continue this morning now with the word. A scripture that I've been sharing with you, it won't be on screen today, but for the first uh, two messages of the series, Kingdom Justice, the prophet Micah, he has told you, old man, what is good, and what is it that the Lord requires? He requires that 
us to do justice, right? To love kindness and to walk humbly before your God. And I broke that down, that particular scripture, looking at the uh, verses prior to that. Um, and so now I'm going to go in a little uh, kind of connected uh, direction, but a little bit different. As I've been talking to you about uh, kingdom justice, and by the way, when I, when I say kingdom justice, I'm talking about God's kingdom. You realize that God does have a kingdom. A man has his own kingdom or kingdoms has set up. Uh, Satan actually even has a kingdom. But kingdom justice is about the kingdom of God. And it's all about living life under God's goodness, his rule, his authority, his dominion, his protection, his grace, his mercy. And when we do that, you and I, that in turn pr produces a, a better quality I'm not going to say qu better quality of life because someone will, will say, yeah, right, you don't know what I'm going through right now. So let me say a better quality of inner life. Amen? A better quality of inner life. And that I believe wholeheartedly that eventually that will manifest outwardly in your life and in mine. When we submit ourselves uh, to his rule and reign in his kingdom, that's what's going to bring peace to your life and mine, even when there's turmoil uh, all around us, when things are swirling and whatnot. Now, God wants his people to be prayerful. We are to pray without ceasing at all times. We are to be prayerful, not only about praying for um, things we need. God knows what we need. We may pray for things that we want, but if and we may pray for others, but he, he wants us to really be able to discern the times that we live in, as the sons of Issachar uh, were doing. We need to be aware of what's going on in society around us, but never let society lead us. Amen? Make sense? We're part of society, but we belong to another kingdom. We are living in this world and I know this may scare some of you, but we're not of this world, okay? We're here, uh, but we have a, a destination in mind. And we are supposed to call on heaven to be brought down to earth. Right. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so who, who he has on earth is his people, is his church. You and I living under God, and you and I or any other believer living under God's kingdom justice is not the same as someone living under the umbrella, and I'll use this term, let's say, of secular humanism. It, it, it's, not, it's not the same. And the world might try to conflate the two, or, or they think that maybe... The two concepts are the same, but I'm telling you this morning that they usually are not. It is critically important, I'm telling you critically important, that all believers, say all, 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 all who profess that Jesus is Lord, that we know what God has to say on any matter, any single matter, and that includes justice. How do we find that out? We find that out through his word. And as the Holy Spirit, who dwells on the inside of every believer, is teaching us and guiding us into all truth. As believers, you and I have to be careful not to be drawn away by the emotions or the rhetoric of any moment. Now listen, this applies to us individually. You and I can be going through certain emotions at any given moment and God says listen don't get don't get swept away by this stuff this is why it's important and we all may have those moments but we have to be careful because sometimes we do some crazy stuff and we think some crazy thoughts when we're even led by our emotions is that not right now God gave us our emotions but he never said to be led by them for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. And so you have a, a spirit. If you're a born-again believer, you have a spirit. You still have your soul. You have your mind, your will, and your emotions. How many of you know that when you came to God for the very first time, 
you found out shortly after that you were still cra thinking some crazy stuff <laughs> and possibly doing some crazy stuff. See, again, it's, 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 we have this perception of the magic wand. It does not work like that. God says, get your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. I'm not telling you to get rid of it, but have it submit to the part of you that is born again, to your spirit man or spirit woman. That's what we're supposed to do. And, and, the, fle and, and the flesh, the actual body, is just the, the case that our, uh, our soul and spirit are residing in. It's the shell, so to speak. So we got to be careful not to be drawn away by emotions and rhetoric of any moment. And as believers, we have to be careful not to be swayed by any and every movement that comes along. Because if you study history, and I, I've, I've studied it a bit, you'll understand that there were movements, even in Christian circles, that came and displaced other movements before them. Every time God shone his light on something in his word and was, and, and was explaining through the Holy Spirit the revelation that was already given in his word, people would say, wow, that's amazing. That's what drove Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, to say, wait a minute, I'm hearing... And the church is saying that we're saved by works. And he says, but that's not what the word says. Isn't that novel? He actually was looking at the word and realized that's not what the word of God says. We're not, we're not saved by works. We ought to produce good works, but we're saved through grace by faith. And he, he, he came to realize, he says, no, no, no. And he challenged church leaders. And they didn't want to budge because they had established their own little kingdom of theology and orthodoxy. It's like, yeah, no, no, don't mess with it. We got it good now. But that's not what the word of God says. We realize later on that there was a group that came along that started to, to understand more about what water baptism was and what it wasn't. And they were labeled a term. They were called Anabaptist. And they tried to, to say, listen, this is what we see in the word. Can you read it with us? And so they, were, they went about the doctrine of water baptism. And then some church folk ended up doing was persecuting the Anabaptists. And they actually drowned them in the water. So what I'm telling you is, we have to perceive, we have to discern, we have to know what's going on at all times. And when things are happening in the earth around us, it's a time for us to pray, to seek God's hand, to seek his heart, and have him tell us what exactly is going on. I explained part of that last week. The believer is to be guided by the Lord and by his word, amen? Amen. And so the way I look at it, it if, if what's going on around you and I lines up with the Word of God, great. Then so be it. That's wonderful. So humanistic justice, coined that word, many times is going to fall short of the model that God provides for his people. Why? Well, because God's model is on another level. Uh, it's perfect. You have to understand or believe, if you believe God, you better believe that he's perfect, he's just, he's perfect in all his ways, and that our ways are not his ways. So we need to adapt ourselves to him and not try to adapt him to our ways. So, but the humanistic justice is often going to fall short of the model. Now, in today's modern world, most nations, I would say, most societies have a established rules of, of, of justice and whatnot. Are they lived up to perfectly? No. Why? <laughs> because society and nations are filled with imperfect people. So it, there's bound uh, to be some, some problem there. And then problems do occur when there is either a real or a perceived miscarriage of justice. And I want to tell you, a real, a perceived, or totally made up miscarriage of justice. 
to quickly point out the George Floyd incident, that wasn't perceived. That was a real miscarriage of justice. Amen? That's what it was. It was real. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. But what I'm telling you is sometimes folks get carried away with a perceived miscarriage of justice. And all of a sudden, things get linked together that should not be linked together. Last week, I said that when this happens, what society should not do, what they should not do is completely eradicate the process of judgment and carry out our own form of personal justice, because that's not the answer. What's the answer? The answer is to bring, this is, this is what we shoot for, this is our goal, is to bring every miscarriage of justice under God's standard so that we can line it up and say, does this measure up with what God says or does it not? Now, is the world going to be looking at God's standard? Of course not. That's why <laughs> the world. Believers used to be in the world. All believers used to be in the world. And then we responded to God's invitation and we came out of that world and that kingdom and we got transferred into another one. But the world isn't going to understand. We could say it till we're blue in the face. It doesn't matter. But that's the way it is. So that's, that's what I mean by the world, the non-believer. They're, they're not expected to know God's standard. What's troubling to me is when God's own people don't know it. That's when it becomes problematic. I, I get that the world doesn't know. Wow, that, they're not believing in Christ. But for Christ followers, we got to know exactly what he says on any given matter. What did I say believers are supposed to do? This is what Jesus said. Follow the great two commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, everything that you have. Love him. He said the second is just like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said on these two commandments, on these two, depend the whole law and the prophets. That means the entire law that was given. Now, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses to give to his people, but he also gave them a ton of civil laws, ceremonial laws. On the whole law and on everything that every prophet of God spoke, everything hinges, everything rides on those two commandments. So it's, it's real, it's better to keep it simple. If you and I are striving to love the Lord our God with everything that we have each and every day, if we're, if we're making a, if we're giving it a good college try, we're making a good attempt, then, then we're getting somewhere. And then from there, if we understand that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, that's important too. And kingdom justice flows out of that. Remember, one cannot seek true love. You can't, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. You can't seek true love without also seeking true justice and vice versa. You can't just seek justice without seeking love. They go hand in hand. They work together. Now, here's what I discovered. The concept, again, of using that concept of, of secular humanism, right? It often means, this is what, what the, it means. It often means that there's an equality, an equality in terms of sameness. Same, S-A-M-E-N-E-S-S. -E -E -S. That, that there is an equality in terms of sameness. But I'm submitting to you that that concept is what ultimately often leads to Marxism or socialism. If you've studied world history, and I, I told you I was born in a country like that, that, that got turned over. There are many other nations still today, but that's, that's where it often comes. It means that everything and everybody is the same. What did I tell you last week? I, I don't want to live in that kind of a society, do you? And yet a lot of people are saying yes. They want to live. I don't think they understand what they're asking for. I really don't. I, I, think they're, I think a lot of them are probably just misguided. They're not rotten people, but they're being sold a bill of goods, and they're saying, yeah, that's right. Everything needs to be the same. 
But for those who have lived under that umbrella, if you talk to them years down the road, they usually come to realize that it was not what it was cooked up to be or cracked up to be, whatever you want to say. That concept under secular humanism says that everything should be the same for everyone. Now, stay with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this to you. And I'm going to explain it using God's word. It says that everything should be the same for everyone. Of course, we have to ask ourselves, first of all, is that, is that true? Is, is, is everything the same for everyone? And then I think we would have to qualify what we mean by everything, right? Everything. But secondly, I'd ask this question. Is it biblical? Is that concept biblical? Now, I, I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into it. There's going to be things that you should say should apply the, across the board for everyone, right? There are things. But that concept pushes it. It's, it's going to be everything. So is it biblical? You might originally say, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like something God would say. All right? You know, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds very kind of, that sounds fair. That sounds, that sounds like something God would do. Now, if I would ask you, should law or justice be applied evenly across the board, what would you say? Yes. It's not a trick question. It's not a trick question. If I said, should law and justice be applied evenly, yes, I would agree with that. And, 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 and so would the Lord on that point. But let me, let me explain it further. Marxism or socialism says there should be equal income for everyone. I'm going to use that as an example. So let's think about that. Equal income for everyone. It sounds fair, right, doesn't it? Sounds noble. Maybe, not sure. But I found out that it usually doesn't mean that everybody gets to be a millionaire. Because if, if, I, said, if I said to you, equal income for everyone, everybody's going to be a millionaire, how many would vote for that? Right? Is that reality? Is it biblical? Mm. See, that means it's, it's, it's usually not the case where everybody is a millionaire. It's usually in the total opposite direction. It's in the total opposite direction. Usually means that you'll get paid no matter how well you do your job. All right, so let's go there. So do you think... I don't know if I should ask for a show of hands. It gets a little dicey at times. But I wonder if you ever knew there was someone in your workplace in the same job description, same level, and you were being paid the same, but somehow you were screaming out, there's no justice. Why? You're getting paid the same. It's because you felt... That Bozo, whoever Bozo may be, wasn't doing their share of the job. They were shucking and jiving. I don't know how you can translate that. Slipping and sliding. They, they were doing everything but their job. And if you were honest, you'd realize that you may have done some shucking and jiving in your life. I took advantage. I... I didn't know the Lord. This is before Jesus. And, and I, I worked in a, a big, big city hospital in New York City. You know, I was in an apartment, and me and the guys in it, we'd cover for each other. They say, hey, man, listen, man, I had a hard night last night. I need to sleep it over or have a hangover. All right, dude, not a problem. You cover for me, and we cover. And the person didn't live far away. They go catch some Z's, get all refreshed, and we covered for each other. I remember the time when there was an armory about a block and a half up from where I worked, and uh, the armory had put up a, a basket, a hoop, 
no net. This is New York City, no net. And on the side of the building. I said, I know what I'll do. Can you cover for me? I want to go shoot some hoops. Just a block and a half away. Just a block of people that we knew working in the hospital. And we had, a, I mean, our shirts off. I, I mean, we, we, were, we were playing ball. So if you're honest with you, you probably did it. But think about that now when maybe you and I have matured a little bit. And you're thinking like, why is that person getting paid? Now, sometimes it's just us being jealous and of somebody else. I don't know. But, but you understand? You say, that, that's not fair. Oh, yeah, but, you know, socialism says everybody gets paid the same. You think it's fair that everybody get paid the same no matter how much initiative you display? Is that how you want to be judged? I mean, you can have a whole lot of initiative, and Bozo may have no initiative. But you're getting paid all the same. Do you think that's good? Is that fair? No. Better yet, is it biblical? Is it biblical? The real truth is that kingdom justice in God's kingdom does allow for differences. Listen, he allows for differences in DNA, right? You understand that? That your fingerprint is unique? There may be others close to it, like it, similar, but not, not I, how God does that, it blows my mind how he does it, but he does it. No, one, no two people have ever been found to have the exact 150% fingerprint. There's DNA markers, and then DNA markers, they, they, they tie you in to uh, genetics, through genetics, to your family members, and so on and so forth. Now, does God allow for differences in DNA? Yeah. Well, look around the world today. Does he allow for differences in income wealth? I mean, are there people that make more money than you? And are there people that you make more money than they do? I mean, we don't go around brandishing our paychecks, but in other words, it's a reality. It's a reality. And so people that want to strive and say, I want better and I want to be able to provide for my family, you, you try to get in the, in the best position so that if you are properly motivated, you can show initiative, you can show a strong work ethic, and you're, you're trusting that someone above you recognizes you and one day gives you a bump. Not this kind of a bump, but a bump in the check, right? In the kingdom world of God, is there a difference in calling? Now, God calls all his people. That's what the word church means. Ecclesia means the called out ones. We were all called out of one kingdom and called into his kingdom. But within that, individually, are there different callings? Is there someone that was called to do this and another one to do that, right? Or, or is it all the same? It's the same that we were taken from one kingdom into another, but within it individually, does everybody have the same calling? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. How about natural gifting? I mean, if I were to poll just the folks in this audience and find out, what did God even naturally gift you with? I was working on the message yesterday. Two of our servant leaders come and try to fix a door in my wife's office, you know, Rob and, and Joe. I kept asking, you guys need any help? But you, 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 yeah, easy, easy in the audience. Because you know what, that's, that's the reaction I got from Rob. He wasn't, he wasn't as jesting as you all are, but he, he would just smile. He'd go like this, and i go, dude, do you need my help or what? I mean, so I, I don't know if he did it just to make me feel good. He goes, you know, you know what, Pastor, yeah, I could use you. Can you come over here and try to lift the door for him or something? Like that. I figured out a long time ago that was not my natural call. It just, it just, it just wasn't. It just wasn't. It's just, uh, I've said this before, when it comes to, you know, technical stuff, when it's dealing with uh, TVs and stuff like that, 
would be 1-800-CALL-ROSE. And then from Rose to our children, you know, Justin has become very uh, uh, adapt to that. I mean, uh, I mean, I look around and I, I see my son, and I see Rob Joe, I see my son-in-law, uh, a man that I know here, and I'm thinking that they, they, they got some talent. They got, so they can look at that thing and say, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I'm there trying to look important. I'm like, you need my help? He's like, no, we don't want to bother you. Like, like stick to the word. <laughs> stick to the word. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I, I've accepted that. I'm okay. I'm secure. I'm secure. One of my brothers-in-law years ago I said, man, can you show me how to change? This is years ago. Change the oil. I want to see how to do it. You know, bring the car over. And then he went and changed the oil. And I'm like, yo, what happened there? Like, you didn't show me. And he would go like this. <sighs> okay. Okay, yeah, no confidence. Told you the one that I spent hours, repeat it with me, hours, hours, trying to put my little girl, that time little girl, tricycle together. I told you that one, spread out on the living room floor. I got gadgets and things and screws and bolts and whatever. And, and though that, that instruction was scary. I'm looking at, they have pictures too. The pictures didn't even help me. And I remember, I, I told my wife, I want to do this for her. I want to feel like, you know, I can buy a bike, but let me, let, let me try. And she passed by, you okay, honey? And I was like on the floor. <laughs> And then it was 1-800, call my brother-in-law. He came over. No problem. He didn't poke fun at me. But I felt so little when I said, well, wait a minute, here, here are the instructions. And he said, I don't need that stuff. <laughs> this is how small I felt. I just kind of like, you know, tail between the legs. I just like walked away. Can I get you something? Can I get you some water, anything? And he just wanted to be left alone, and he didn't use the paper, and he put the bike together, and I thanked him. That's why some people can shoot hoops better than others. Some people can shoot on the range better than others, go hunting. You figure if, if I went out there in the wild and shot, I'd hit something, but chances are with me, I wouldn't hit anything. I would be the guy to not find anything to hit. There are people that are great with numbers, people that are great with finances, people that know how to cook. Some people that know how to eat. They go hand in hand. If you have a good cook, find a good eater. A good eater. I think that was part of my natural gift. What about spiritual gifts? Now, I, I've, I've taught on spiritual gifts before. I did a series on that. I mean, is there just one spiritual gift? Right. Now, when it comes to spiritual gifts, your gift or gift mix may find another person with a similar one. Like, like in that sense, you're not the only one in the world that has that particular gift. But within it, God weaves an individual. And there's different layers even between within a specific spiritual gift. Look at the scripture in Romans 12, 4 through the first half of 6. Romans 12, up on screen. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. Now he's talking about the universal church. And individually, we're members one of another. So I want you to see that. Many members, how many bodies? One body. And he tells you there, all the members do not have the same function. If all the members had the same function, how boring would that be? Huh? How boring would that be? Those who are many are one body in Christ, individually members one of another. And since we have gifts that what? differ according to the grace given to us. 
each of us is to exercise them accordingly. In other words, you and I are supposed to use, in terms of a spiritual gift given to us by God, we're supposed to use them accordingly because they differ according to the grace that is given to us. In verse 3, prior to that, Paul had written that God has allotted to each member a measure of faith. So he allots that now there is saving faith. The way believers are saved is confessing with our mouth, believing with our hearts that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that the Father raised him on the third day from the dead. In a nutshell, that's saving faith. But then he's given to each member, each member, each born again believer, a measure of faith. For what reason? So that you and I need faith. He's given us a measure. We need to activate that faith in order to function in whatever spiritual gift or gifts he has given us. Make sense? That is the faith needed to handle or operate in what God has given you. And we know from, from studying this before, he's given us uh, for the betterment of his body. And that was, that was the dynamic thing about spiritual gifts, that they're not given so you and I can get puffed up about it. They're given so that you and I can help build the body. And, and when every member is flowing and activating and doing his or her part, it's for the betterment of the body. Now, he calls us and he equips you and I individually, right, and differently, but it's always in the context, always in the context of operating within his church and as a part of his kingdom. Whatever he gave you and I, he didn't give it so that we could squander it on ourselves, right, and, and, and just be all by our lonesome. It was to be used within the context of the body and as part of the kingdom of God. So there's an individual calling, and again, there's a general calling, right? Um, how many ministers of reconciliation are here today? Raise your hand. If you're a minister of reconciliation, are you serious? For real? Let me see a few in the back row. Oh my God! If you're listen, if you're a born again believer, we are. See, you got you got you got taken back by the word minister. We are all ministers of reconciliation. Every single hand should have been up, and if not, see me after service. No, so I can explain it. See me after service. Every believer is a minister of reconciliation. You were reconciled. And if he reconciled you, now he wants you to be a minister of the reconciliation you had with God. And you can help someone else reconcile. We're all men. How many ambassadors of Christ do we have? Okay, more hands. Some still not sure. Huh. Yeah, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. See, true reconciliation is a form of real justice. And according to 1 Peter, we're not turning there, God had called his children to be a chosen race. Not a, a, a black race, brown race, or white race. 1 Peter is saying, God, is, you are to be a chosen race. God chose you. He called you to be a royal priesthood. What, me? Yes, you. A holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that they may proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And every time, every day that someone is added to the body of Christ, that is what ultimately they learn to recognize, and to then become. I mean, you don't, right away, when someone comes to the Lord, you say, okay, now you're a minister of records. They don't know what that means. You're an ambassador for Christ. They don't, they don't know what that means, but you explain it to them. Is that making sense? Okay, since it's not, go to Matthew 25. Let's go to Matthew 25. And Jesus has been talking straight a lot of stuff, right? 25, we're going to read 14 through 19. You'll recognize this. This is known as the parable of the talents, right? 
So he's talking, he says, well, look, it's just like a man who's about to go on a journey who calls his own slaves or servants and he entrusts and entrusted his possessions to them. To the one servant, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. Each according to his own. That's what the word says, right? That's what Jesus is saying. He's giving them that earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He's saying, I gave to one, this, this man gave to one five. To this one, he gave two. To this one, one according to his own ability. And then he goes away. Immediately, the one who had received the five went and traded with him. He gained five more. Verse 17, in the same manner, the one who had received the two gained two more. And there's that famous word in the English language, but. But. But he who received the one talent went away. He dug a hole in the ground, hid his master's money. After a long time, verse 19, the master of those slaves came, and what did he do? He settled accounts with them. Now, if you think this is a nice, nice little story, you know, about, you know, one guy going and investing and, and so on and so forth, and, and the other one knowing how to dig a hole in the ground and, and, and hiding the one talent and whatnot. So understand. First, you and I have to know who, who, the, who the master in this parable represents. Who do you think it represents? The Lord, right? Represents the Lord. Who do the servants represent? Ah, the savvy group. That's right. There's no, no trick. It represents us, right? It represents his people. Now, there's something that God had going on with the nation of Israel. There's a covenant a natural covenant with Israel that, by the way, exists still to this day. This is why we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Right? It existed today. But there was an olive tree, and then people along the passage of time were grafted into that tree. People like me, people like you. Now, the pre we're not turning there, but the previous passages, if you go back even to the previous chapter... The Lord's been talking about a lot of stuff. He's been talking about end times. He's been talking about his second return when he comes back. It all has to do really with kingdom living until the point that he comes back. He talks about how people of God, people of God, are to conduct themselves before he returns. This is not really a story on how to read or play the stock market. This is, this is not that. Although to me, it, it's a lot about investment, obedience, and faithfulness. Investment, and I don't mean in the stock market, investment, obedience, and faithfulness. He gave something to each of the three servants. Were they the same amounts? No, different amounts. Oh, how's that? What happened? Who did it belong to in the first place? The Lord. He's saying the possessions were his. He entrusted his possessions to them. So it belonged to them. But he gave to each one a different amount. Oh, wait a second. That's not fair. Today, somebody like Senator Bernie Sanders would call that income inequality. But it's the Lord who's doing this. That's why natural talents, we all don't have the same. Spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit gives them out as he wills, and he plants people in the body as he wills that also. Later on in verse 29, it's not up on screen. Listen to what Jesus is saying in the conclusion, towards the conclusion of this parable. He says, for to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance, or she. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. What? From the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Something tells me, well, I know for a fact that he gave according to their ability. 
That means it was the Lord who was assessing the ability that each of those servants had. And he gave to them according to their ob ability. Something tells me that this master in the parable wasn't too shocked to find out that slave number three hadn't really done anything. Now, let's think about it. Did he, did he lose it? Did he misspend it? He just didn't do a thing with what God had given him. And sometimes we don't do what we're supposed to do with what God has given us. We figure it's up to somebody else to do it. I'm just here for the ride, they'll say. But I, I don't really need to do it. He says, no, no, listen. Even, even the one who has is going to be taken away. And later in verse 30, he says, throw out the worthless slave. See, many in the last days will say, Lord, Lord, Lord. He goes, why are you calling me Lord? Lord, did we not do this in your name? That means they even use his name. Did we not even perform miracles? That means that even some people will perform miracles. And if you study end times, you'll understand that this is going to happen. And so the people of God need to be discerning, but we need to be about the Father's business. See, that's what brought me to Christ. I said, I, I didn't have one of those testimonies that everything was going wrong in life. Everything was actually quite cool. It was nice. And, and there was a void somewhere deep in my heart. I'm going, there's got to be more to life than this. And so now God invades your scene and mine. He gave each person based on the ability. And he's the one, though, that gave the abilities also to begin with. But that also tells me that there's something that you and I are able to do with whatever abilities or blessings or things he's entrusted to us or insight, or knowledge, or revelation, whatever it is he's given us, we're supposed to do something with us. So who gave you and I our abilities? You sure? Mm. Who's Jehovah Jireh? The Lord, our provider. And he's just real so, so simple. Oh, I, I've got to provide. Oh, <laughs> I turn it on him. Lord, please help me provide for my family. Lord, you're the provider. Who called you and I out of darkness and into his marvelous light? He did, the Lord. Who had you and I transferred from someone else's kingdom, someone else's control, and brought us under his kingdom of light, of blessing, of righteousness, of goodness, and yes, even justice? Who did that? The Lord did that. That's what he's called us under. It's, this goes beyond money. It includes it, but it goes beyond money. Listen to me. We are supposed to display as believers, not just at TBC, but in all other churches, we're supposed to display how good it is to live under God's rule in a fruitful and a fulfilled manner. If you're walking around like Eeyore, you know, you know Eeyore? The Winnie the Pooh thing? I mean, we all have some down days. Listen to me. We all have them. But if that's how a person who says they're a believer consistently walks, there's something terribly wrong. And I don't mind telling you that. I don't want to walk that way. Oy vey. Uh. We can be real with one another. One of my guys asked me how I was doing this yesterday. I wasn't doing all that hot, and I appreciated that. I didn't lie and say, it's all good, brother. God is good. Meanwhile, you got stuff dripping out of your nose. I don't want to discuss you, but you know what I'm saying? Just, I could be doing better. I'm talking about consistently just being like, like, like an Eeyore. I know the giddiness of Tigger will also throw some people off. You're thinking like, okay, that's a bit too much. 
<laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that everything always goes smoothly because it doesn't. We know that. But you and I are supposed to conduct ourselves faithfully and use wisely everything that the Lord has given us. Everything. Whatever God has given you and I, we are supposed to use for his glory. Amen? What does that mean? That means our relationships. How we handle our relationships. How we deal with those that are around us are very close. How, how spouses treat one another. Spouses, right, to each other. How parents treat children. Children treat parents. I've said that before. How we are conduct ourselves in, in the household of God. It means we are, are, are to conduct ourselves faithfully and use wisely even the jobs that God has blessed us with. It never fails me to understand when someone's been praying for a job, then God gives them a job and they declare God gave them the job and then you don't see them anymore. I know, this is not a great way to build the church. That's what I got. Right? So they say, oh, yeah, God gave it. Oh, so God gave it to you, so now, now, now what? Where are you with God? I thought it was a blessing. Well, I say, think carefully. If you have a desire to be married one day, that's a good thing. God put that in your heart. And let's say you're a young lady, and you're thinking, oh, God, I, I, I pray he bring me a godly man. And then wouldn't you know it, all kinds of guys start coming by, knocking on the door. Oh, this must be the Lord. Oh, Lord, thank you. Lord, did you see the muscles on him? Of course you did. You gave them to him. Lord, he says he loves Jesus. God gave us a brain. It's about time we start using it. Huh? Is that right? Yeah? Yeah, it's about time. Yeah. Well, the guy says, oh, my goodness, you must be for the Lord, baby. You can really cook. And it says that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. She cooked. Dude, you, you, might, you might be setting yourself up for a whole lifetime of pain if you pick wrongly. You know, it's about stomach. Just go out to Burger King. You know, go, go get a pizza pie. Do whatever you got to do. I'm thinking like, that, shouldn't, that should, not, should, not, should not be the precedent that you set. Can I share something about my wife and I? Do you mind? Okay. <laughs> She'll tell me one of these conversations, joking around. She'll say, oh, honey, if God ever takes me, you know, I'm sure it won't be like two days before you get married. I'm like, what? And, we, you know, we're laughing and all. She goes, oh, yeah. You want somebody that can cook. So we're laughing hysterically. We're bantering. I'm thinking to myself, but then we get on a serious note. I said, honey, listen, this man will survive. Before you cooked, I was. <laughs> I was. Okay? And I was finding myself going here. I'm not telling you I ate healthy, but I was. I was around. I'm thinking like, no, 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 no way. Does that make sense? Yeah. That means we, we use wisely our relationships, our jobs, our opportunities. Sometimes God will open the door. We don't take advantage of the opportunity. I'm saying God because sometimes somebody else provides an opportunity and it's not the Lord. That means we use wisely even the finances he gives us. Uh-oh, don't go there, Pastor, not that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, because... I declare that whatever finances my wife and I have had over the years belong to the Lord. 
But I'll be, I'll be honest with you. There were moments and times that we did not manage them well. Does that shock you? We're going a way back, right? We do this. We, we conduct ourselves faithfully and use wisely everything that the Lord has given us. For what reason? So that we might show others how gracious, how loving, how merciful, and how just our God is. You see, the servant with the one talent, hit the problem, the sin he committed is he, he misrepresented who God was and who God is. And God is looking at his own people today and saying, don't misrepresent who I am. Don't give me credit for things, this is like if the Lord is speaking, don't give me credit for things that you've done on your own. I had nothing to do with it. Or he'll say, I had all this stuff here for you, and you didn't do anything with it. That's also misrepresenting God. And so you say, wow, why are you so hard on the church? Because judgment begins in the household of God first. That's, we're representing him. The Lord is going to return one day. I hope you know that. One day he's going to return to settle accounts with his people. And he's going to want to know if all that we did and all that we said flowed out of those two great commandments. That's what he's going to want to know. If we loved unconditionally in the same manner as he loved us. Remember last week I said he's not going to ask you or I to do what he has not already done. So he's going to, he's going to say, have you loved unconditionally? Well, everybody except Sister Betty, because you got to know Sister Betty, Lord. No. He said, I loved you unconditionally. He's going to want to know if we extended mercy and forgiveness when it was called for. Now, you'll be surprised in the, in, the, in the succeeding weeks, it's not always called for. Shocker. Stay tuned. But if when it was called for, did we extend mercy and forgiveness? He's going to want to know, believers, if we honored marriage and raised our children as he would want. If we lived as lights in the world and as salt to the earth. If we spoke truth in love, rather than saying a lie, or not saying something when we should say something. If we stood for the Lord and for his gospel, even when it would have been more convenient or less risky for us to stay quiet. And there's a whole lot of people staying quiet. A lot of people don't want to risk getting intimidated by all, all sorts of stuff and, and, and cancel culture. Let me tell you, God canceled my sins and my trespasses. How's that? that that's the can, cancel culture I'm going. God gave me a brain. I'm going to use it. I'm not a mindless robot. Every time some people just say, uh, uh, do this, do that, do it. And you shouldn't either. Can I get an amen? I thought this was a risk-free service. I don't know who told you that. God will want to know if you and I stood by silently when we saw people treated unjustly. And so it's important that we speak up when we see that and speak against it, right? Not because a, a group of people is asking me to. It's because I'm informed by what the Lord says. I'm directed by his Holy Spirit. I'm inspired by the word of God. He's going to want to know if we stood for the Lord even when we vote for people to, to office. He's going to want to know are we really being guided by the word of God who, when we elect people who won't blink an eye to the taking the life of an unborn child. Now, that may not make me popular with the world, but I think you know me. I'm not looking for popularity. I'm looking for truth, and I'm looking for justice. 
And we vote, we got believers voting for people that have no problem snuffing out the life of God's creation. You don't have the right. And if you're a believer and you do that, here's the good news, maybe the bad news. God is going to come one day and settle accounts with all of us. We got men maybe beating up on women. You got to speak against that. What is that? If you know about it, what is that? God's going to want to know if we, we were standing or promoting for things that God's word doesn't even promote. But you see, you got to know what the word says first. I wonder if, if God wonders sometimes if we'll just be cowards and not call things exactly as they are. In the time I have left on this earth, whatever time that is, this is the way I prefer to go out. You understand me? Standing for God. Standing for the principles of the Lord teaching and training people and hopefully modeling something that they can look up to that will point them towards Christ. God's going to settle accounts with his own people first. Listen, we don't need mob justice. We need kingdom justice. Now, here's what God's kingdom justice does permit, though. He, he does permit opportunities. So you have differences in, in natural gifting, spiritual gifting, Income, whatever, okay, that's great. But he provides opportunities for access to him and to his Zoe life. That's the thing. You, you don't say that it's a certain people that can come to know God. He's got his door wide open for any single person. Why? So that no one person, not any group of people or a class of people, would be able to control everything in such a way that it suppresses other people. And, and, and God's kingdom justice calls for that it calls for equality under his law where everyone is entitled to fair justice isn't that true everyone is entitled to fair justice doesn't matter if they're rich or poor doesn't matter if they're college educated or not it's defined by God's standards for how we relate to him and then to others as I often say the gospel his gospel levels the playing field for anyone who calls upon, that's what I love, whosoever, whosoever. Oh, but you don't understand what I've been through. Whosoever, God wants to give you a new life. He wants you to understand and know that when you come to him, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are as new. You get a new lease on life. And that's what we ought to encourage people with. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, anyone who confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart that he is both Lord and Savior. The church. And I'm going to say it again, the church. Not the white church, black church, or brown church. Amen? The church. His body needs to lead the way. I'm going to read something not on screen out of Romans 12. We'll be closing shortly, but, but I had read to you in, in 12, it was up on screen, verses 4 through 6. But later on, after he mentioned some specific, as examples, some gifts, spiritual gifts, prophecy, teaching, serving, exhortation, giving, and leading, uh, mercy, I want, I, just, I want you to listen. This is going to be chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Just kind of listen. Here's what the writer, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is encouraging people then and people now with. Let love be without hypocrisy. This is about kingdom justice. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor or hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. 
rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, in case you thought tribulation wasn't going to come our way. Yeah, persevering in it, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind. Here it is now, the sameness. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty or proud in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own eyes or in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, all mankind. If possible, so far as it depends on you, meaning so far as you and I can control it, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved. Believe room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Why are you giving me food? Why are you giving me drink? I don't agree with you. I actually hate you. Be blessed. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, I, I was looking yesterday, that wasn't originally going to be. I'm thinking like, wow, that's kingdom justice right there. Kingdom justice. Romans 11, 36. Because when I was looking at Romans 12, you know, chapters were put in by men. And so I went back to 11. Here's how 11 ends. For from him and through him and to him are some things are all things to him be the glory forever amen so be it from him the lord through him and to him are all things he's the one that ought to make you get up in the morning and say here's another day of opportunity that i have to glorify my god to do good unto somebody else to make sure justice is being done this is the day, Lord, that I will not look at things I ought not to look at. Touch things I ought not to touch. I ought to conduct myself faithfully and handle wisely everything because everything came from him that is good. Every perfect gift comes from above. And after that, verse 36 is scriptures that we quote often here is the first two in Romans 12. Paul says, because everything is from him, everything's through him, and because to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. He goes, therefore, because of this, brethren, by the tender mercies of God, I urge you, present your bodies to be a living and a holy sacrifice because of who God is, because of what God has done for you, because of what God has done for some of your loved ones. Do it, present it, a living, holy sacrifice, something that's acceptable to God. He says that's your reasonable service of worship. It's the rational one. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you, my people, may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what the church is supposed to be all about. That's what the church ought to be doing. You say, what does this have to do with justice? It has everything to do with justice. I'm laying a foundation. If we are guided by those two commandments, if that informs us, if that directs us, if that is developed in us, how can we go wrong? Our God is a good God. Let's stand to our feet and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus. We glorify you now, Lord, from you, through you, and to you. Be all things, Lord. We're grateful for the opportunity 
Father, we want to live on this earth as though heaven were here right now. It is only through your body in perfect vessels saved by a perfect God, unrighteous and sinful people saved by a very righteous, just, holy, and sinless God. That you caused incredible things to come our way, and the most incredible thing that comes our way is you. We love you, we honor you, we worship you, and we ask, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. All my failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You call my name. Church, have a great Sunday. We'll see you back here next week.